Next also does download uh, Java onto your computer that sits in your temp files. Um, and that's different from what we do. Uh, essentially, everything is online. It recognizes everything from, from that server, the physician's able to control uh, camera output, microphone, that sort of thing remotely, uh, but nobody has to download anything. Okay. I was wondering about the physician liability. I mean, if a patient is taking their own blood pressure through their mobile device or taking a blood glucose, if I'm peeing on their phone, <laughs> at what point does the physician say, well, now I didn't supervise the administration of this test, I just saw what they said? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. I don't know if I have a, a really good answer for that particular or when they say that. Typically, um, I will say this much typically, and this I talked with uh, one of the major malpractices <coughs> that and they and they insure or that's a part of their malpractice coverage, is that you can do telemedicine, you'll be covered for that. What they see with telemedicine is that and, and compare it to traditional practice, uh, it's about half the rate of malpractice suits using telemedicine. And part of that speaks to that, okay, well, we're not doing chest pain, we're not birthing babies online. Yeah. You know, we're, we're treating ear infections. How much, how much you know, liability can there really be? And I think that's it. And I think that's also really ultimately up to, the, up to the clinician to say, you know, this really isn't a fit. You're gonna need to come in, I need to see you. So, and that's up to them to make that sort of judgment call. This is kind of cloud uh, mm -hmm. technology, right? How would the um, patient's data store? Um, we don't store data? any data. We're a pass-through. Uh, essentially, much like the telephone company, when you call a patient at home, uh, the telephone company doesn't store anything. We don't store anything on our end. We do have that ability to where if you want to record something, if you want to record the session, we will store it, but only for 72 hours. And if you don't get it off our server in 72 hours, it's gone. Because they have their right of science, their social science, I mean, all the privacy, the mm -hmm. PHI. Yeah. So those things, how you're handling it? Well, it works in conjunction with that. We don't, that doesn't actually work through our system. So somebody will have a, a PHR or an EMR alongside it. Um, we are, we just uh, started with another startup who's got a, an EMR and they're going to include the, t the software or the, the link for the software in their EMR. But once again, we're pass through. We have nothing to do with that. Is, yeah, so we don't have to store anything. We don't have to worry about that. Um, when you're saying that the patient, you know, the doctor can say, well, I need you to come in, have you all seen where do they pay for both, both visits, the insurance companies, or do they, like, bundle it, or? Um, typically speaking, and I'll, I'll, I'm going to speak as a clinician mm -hmm. on this part. Uh, generally speaking, if we tell them that they should come in, and they come in that day, we can only charge them once anyway. Right. So. At that point, we have a decision. Do we charge them when they're here at the office? Do we charge a telemedicine visit? Most assuredly, we're going to say it's at the office right. because we can get a better reimbursement. Right. We're going to do more. Um, I would say that if we if we say we s s need to come in and the patient doesn't come in till the next day, we're going to charge for both. You know, if we're seeing you twice, mm -hmm. we told you to come in, but you waited until the next day, we're going to do both. Do you charge. think they'll pay for both? Uh, yeah, if it's if it's separated, if it's uh, in, you know another calendar day, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just like they pay for follow-ups. It will we routinely have a patient where they've got an infection, we've lanced, you know, uh, a wound, and we right. said, okay, come back in 24 hours. Let's take a look at this, and then we can. We can I guess charge it would be that. easy to prove medical necessity if you couldn't do what you were trying to do the first day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's exactly. It. Or it's just a, or it's just a, you know, this is probably something more. I need you to come in, come in tomorrow. Um, but like, I'm hypothesizing because we've never run into that yet. Okay. You know, we're pretty diligent, and the clinicians that we that use the system are pretty diligent that we've got this certain set of criteria, and if we don't go beyond it, and that is follow-ups for lab work, um, right. psychiatric sort of stuff. Uh, try mind, to just yeah. Dip it in the butt at the beginning. Exactly. So they have a clear indication, and if they stray from that, they stray from that. But we haven't had any reports. Yet. Oh, sorry, I miss anyone over here. Okay. So, what type of protocols do you have that secure the transmission, mm -hmm. like encryption, or we have several. Actually, we have several layers. The the basic layer is a 124-bit encryption, um, which is you know it's better than the phone company. You know, if you call someone from a landline, we're, we're actually better encrypted, and it's because we don't store it. It 
you know, you have to break that encryption in real time in each moment. It's kind of impossible. I mean, maybe you can do it. Uh, so that's part of it. Uh, on top of that, we've also got extra packets that we can uh, secure from the machine uh, itself and do that if we want to add that. But that takes a little bit more processing power. We want to make sure that we, we generally recommend that for institution to institution where we can assure that they've got a, they don't have a smartphone that they're using right. you know, to do this, that they've got an actual good computer. Are you talking about, or what you said about identifying passengers and stuff like that via your phone? Mm -hmm. if, if they're talking about being able to potentially do this, are you including things like doing like a, like a CBC and all, like the full um, lab? That depends. Like that would be cool. But I don't know. I mean, I've done I've done a telemedicine visit myself, where I had a patient from uh, Georgia Tech, actually, and I was in Athens, um, and I ordered blood tests and everything. But I had to go to a lab that was real close to me. So it's not necessary. But as far as that, it, that part, it's going to be it's going to be dependent on what those you know new innovative companies that are still building this sort of stuff, how it works, and, and what the efficacy is, and how expensive it is, and so uh, you mentioned telemedicine is for, for agile facilities. Mm -hmm. So how do you communicate this exactly to the patient? Because he doesn't know. He just thinks that he can just log in and he can just go to it, hook up with any uh, doctor. So how do you communicate this? Okay, if you don't, if you have this approaches, if you don't, if you don't have this, please don't approach. Um, generally speaking, in the office, it's uh, the the receptionist. Just like if you would try to call and say, "Hey, listen, I've got a cold," uh, they're going to say, "Okay, well, let's make an appointment for you." Hey, I've got chest pain. Let me go talk to the doctor. And that's kind of the way it's handled. The secretaries will answer the phone and say, "What's going on?" I'd like, "Oh, you'd like to be seen by tell them, you know, telemedicine." What's what are you feeling? And they've got that sort of sheet in front of them, going, "Okay, this is okay." Uh, and then if it falls outside of that, they go talk to the doctor and get and find out. And then they have, you know, particulars. If I'm having chest pain, if I'm, you know, I'm passing out, they automatically know that you need to come in and emergency room. I have another question. Mm -hmm. There is a possibility that my physician could be somewhere placed in Taipei. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So for a follow check, following check, how do they really uh, say, like, okay, you need to go to this location for the follow up? Mm -hmm. um, okay. So you're saying that you go to a telemedicine facility, or you're talking as a patient who's sitting in their home for a follow up? Yeah. For the initial visit, he is uh, meeting some doctor in California. Oh, okay. And for the follow-up, he is, how do the system know that, okay, you go to uh, the follow-up visit for this location? Mm -hmm. um, ultimately, it works um, in such a way that we don't, you know, the patient can be anyone. We just had a telemedicine conference between um, someone here in Georgia and the Philippines. Um, <coughs> And so we don't know, we, well, I should say this, we can track it. We can track IP addresses so we can get a general location within about 100 miles of where they are. Um, and that's part of that sort of HIPAA compliance is that not only do we have to be secure, but if there is a breach, we gotta figure out where it was and what happened. Um, so we have that capability. So if we've got, if we know Dr. Jones is going to California on vacation and somebody calls a patient from Georgia saying they're Dr. Jones, we go, wait a second, that's a breach. We we figured that out. You know, if, if there's a, if there's an issue with that. But other than that, we can't drill down into your particular computer or anything like that to know it was you or where you are. So ultimately, if I guess from a compliance standpoint, it's hard to you know it's hard to know unless you've got a, seat, a suite set up where there are other staff members that verify that this is a patient that is coming in. Uh, some uh, physicians who have uh, licenses. I was how wondering. Can, uh, how can he practice in Georgia? Um, okay. A if a, and okay, first I'm not aware. <laughs> we got some of those in here. Okay, good. <laughs> the guy with the suits. Oh, <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so my understanding of, of statutes is that in order for the physician to treat a patient. In their own state, they have to be licensed in their own state, obviously. Mm -hmm. If they want to treat a patient in, let's say they're in Georgia and they want to treat someone in North Carolina, they have to have a license in North Carolina. And if they have moved to California, 
uh, and they want to treat a patient in Georgia, they just need the, the, their license in Georgia. Now, I think the gray area, gray area comes in is what happens when people who are residents of Georgia mm -hmm. go to Florida on vacation and they get a cold and they want to connect with their physician. And I don't have an answer to that. That's kind of in that gray area. You know, does, does it go by where they are or does it go by where their, their primary residence is if they're traveling? And I don't know. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Um, there are... Right now, I know the psychology community is really wrestling with this. Nobody wants to give them a clear answer. So it's kind of um, it's kind of like the Old West. Uh, you have some psychologists who are out there who are connecting to multiple states uh, without licenses uh, in those particular states. Um, but even their own sort of governing body hasn't told them that that's wrong. They, they've asked and they kind of left it up in the air. They've been very ambiguous. But for medicine, for nursing, for uh, and obviously with medicine and PAs, it's it's crystal clear you've got to be registered in the state where the patient is. Some of what I my reading and this may again be wrong, but is for primary care visits, you have to be registered and, and certified, and, and licensed mm -hmm. in that state. But for specialist consults, okay, mm -hmm. uh, good point. You could actually tap into other resources, bring them, and these vary by states actually. Exactly. So some states would allow you others. Yeah, and that, that's, that's true with the, with the specialist consult. If they've got another physician in the room or if you are consulting in order to help with the decision-making process but you are not affecting treatment on the patient, then that's okay from, to go from state to state is what I understand. I have a question. This may be a tough one for you, and I know your problems are going to hit you where it hurts. How do you demonstrate the value if you want to make a big sale? Doctors, hospitals, systems, insurance companies. Um, do you have quantitative studies or even several anecdotes, qualitative studies where you can go and say, okay, this is the benefit to the patient, or these are the benefits to patients, these are the benefits to doctors, and these are the benefits to the hospital and health systems or what have you, and this is why you should buy my product. Uh, no qualitative or quantitative studies as of yet, but what we do have is uh, the typical telemedicine consult is coded as a 99213, uh, which is about $69, something like that. The average, or and what it's becoming the average intra-office visit when they actually come into the office is a 99214, so that's another 10 to $20 more. Um, so we've got that. There's all there's lots of data out there showing the benefit for patients, obviously, because you have travel costs, you have work work time off from work and that's been well established but there is no and that's one of the problems with telemedicine right now there's no really big quantitative studies that show definitively that this reduces costs it makes sense on a on a philosophical level uh, on a sort of a, an operational level it makes sense but no one has ever really done the study uh, in a large enough manner to say that this actually saves health care dollars um, when do you think that it has the potential to kind of, and just your personal opinion, to deter uh, potential physicians or PCPs from entering this field due to the decreased, uh, I guess, personability? Or not, I don't know if that's the. They don't, they don't feel like they're really connected. Yeah, because it seems like they already have somewhat of an issue with <coughs> EMRs, etc., and detracting from the patients. So do you? Oh yeah, we, we see well. and we have yeah we have some uh, clinicians that definitely bring that up. That they feel, hey, I, I want to be there with the patient. I want to touch them. Mm -hmm. You know that sort of thing. There, the, I, absolutely. Yeah. So there are some that are like that, and I would say there are others that are um, are not. Yeah. You know, they they essentially see the vision of um, making a making this more, and we, and this may speak a little bit to the marketing piece, um, but uh, if this is more convenient. For patients, this is really kind of cool, uh, and if I can market this to the community that I'm doing this for patients and I have their benefit, uh, their benefit is really at the heart of what I'm, why I'm doing this, then I'm going to get those particular patients that resonate with me. Um, and so and that's been a big part of what we've seen with practices when they join in. Part of what we do at Smart House Calls is not only the, the software and training them on the software and providing 24-7 support and making sure we're HIPAA compliant. But the other really big half of this is that Smart House Calls also really delves in 
and helps out with your the marketing to those individual patients or with the health center marketing out into the community and helping sort of formulate um, how this might look and what the marketing so ultimately our goal we under, well not our goal but what we understand is, is that if we sell this system and it doesn't get used they're going to kick us out they just you know why why do i have this and why am i paying this money so we understand that we've got to drive success and when they're successful they don't want to leave alone it's kind of like your email can you ever imagine <coughs> not looking at email for a day you use it a lot exactly yeah <laughs> say that but you're always, you know, i'm always on my phone checing it and that but that's that's the kind of company we want to be is that it's so successful that they can't imagine living without it so the marketing is a big part of it how did how did the patients learn about it through the physician so uh email glass uh posters uh and you know nice posters within the doctor's office that talks about and kind of gives that idea of what telemedicine is about um it can be radio advertisements when you're trying to attract new patients um uh well, HCA is about to put up a billboard probably in the next couple of months talking about uh, that they're using smart house calls telemedicine. So that's, that's so within the practice, we have print materials that are there, but we also have email pushes that go through the doctor's office, not from smart house calls that let their, their patient know through the end. That's, 